At least I didn't throw it on the floor this time. Good morning, good fall morning. What a beautiful morning. Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of the Catskills. Our minister, Reverend Bob Janice Dillon. I'm Kathy Atwell. I'm your worship assistant for this morning. A big welcome to everyone, whether you're joining us via Zoom, be in your living room, bedroom, porch, garden, or car. We're glad you are here. And we are glad all of you are here in person. Unitarian Universalism is a liberal religious faith that carries no creed and welcomes all seekers. Whoever you are, whomever you love, wherever you are in life's journey, you are welcome here. We are guided by a set of principles and written sources that encompass the many ways we come to know and understand the world the universe, and the divine. Our principles are based on, are important to us at UU Catskills, and we live our values on a daily basis. We affirm that Black Lives Matter. We're a welcoming congregation for the LGBTQ community. We're a congressional affiliate of the Ulster Immigration Defense Network. We're an active voice in the Ulster Immigration Defense Network. I said that, didn't I? We're an active voice in the effort to address climate change, and we acknowledge that our sanctuary is built on Lene Lenape Nation's ancestral land. If you'd like to contact someone at UU Catskills, you can check at um, uucatskills.org. If you are a visitor here in person, are there, do we have any visitors? Can we see it? Oh, we got one, oh, two, three. I was so excited. Thank you for coming. Welcome. And afterwards, please stay and have coffee and refreshments. And if you'd like to talk to some of our uh, membership committee, Mary, right back there holding her hand up, would love to talk to you. And we hope you that, you, that you come back. We encourage you to read our October newsletter that is distributed through our email list and is posted online at our website. We have community circles, which connect members to others that live in their local community. There are eight circles in different areas who meet monthly in person or online in Zoom. If you'd like to get in touch with the circle in your areas, please contact the Office Administrator. And I'll put a little plug in here. Kingston East Community Circle is October's host for your refreshments. So. I'm a member of the Kingston East, so that's why I can do it. Assisting with today's service is Catherine Kastner, who's doing our Zoom, and Bruce Wildey's our uh, tech host. After the service, please stay for our breakout rooms if you're doing Zoom, or for our uh, refreshments and coffee in our community area. All right, so uh, our president, Mark, um, Halstein, Howenstein would uh, like to make a few announcements also. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, so a few of those early announcements will be slightly tweaked. Um, we're having an all congregational meeting following the service today here in the sanctuary to talk about um, basically our search for ministry for this coming year and the possibilities of engaging in a joint ministry with Poughkeepsie. So it, it's big stuff, new stuff for all of us. Um, and I think some of the sermon today might tie into not that per se, but maybe pre prepare us for it. Um, with regard to that, there will be no breakout rooms today. Uh, the Zoom will stay on to the meeting itself. So for all of you that are online, um, they will be able to watch uh, the meeting itself. And there will be a few things, unfortunately, um, on, at the meeting that you will have, we will arrange for all of you to fill out. We have surveys here for people that are here to fill out to give us some sense of what type of ministry you want. And I'll say more about this later. Uh, for those online, we will try to send it out uh, via a, a text message or a, an email later this week. Um, so hang around afterwards uh, for the meeting. It's very important. 
Um, the, this is something that we need to gather as much information from the entire community as we can so that we make the most informed decisions on the basis of the entire congregation. Thank you. Our prelude this morning is Strange Lands and People by Robert Schumann, played by Bill Toole. to be with you this morning. It's good to be here. Good to have lovely music. Good to have warmth. It's good that it's fall. We've got fall people here. It's nice, right? It's a little chilly outside and we're grateful for the warmth in here and the warmth of this community. So as, as Kathy said, welcome. However you join us today, wherever you are today in this space uh, at, at home, we're so delighted to be with you uh, on this lovely day. We begin with lighting the chalice, and the chalice is a, a Unitarian Universalist symbol of hope, of inspiration, of justice, and of the inner light, the courage within. So we have a unison chalice lighting, which is on your orders of service or on your Zoom screens. I invite you to say it together. We light this chalice in grateful, loving community. Even in the darkest of times, may its flame light paths to courage, justice, and hope. May I invite us to read our unison affirmation. May we be reminded here of our highest aspirations and inspired to bring our gifts of love to all living beings. May we know once again, we are not isolated, but connected in wonder and joy to mystery and miracle in the universe, in this community, and in each other. And I have an affirmation to, to get us in the spirit, in the mood as we gather together. This is by uh, the poet Eve Ewing uh, from her book Electric Arches, which is an amazing book through and through. And this is the last poem in that book, and it's dedicated to youth living in prison. So anyone who is living in prison now, we send our heart out to you. And this is um, just a beautiful poem of reminding us of, of that we're here and what it means to be here. Speak this to yourself until you know it is true. I believe that I woke up today and my lungs were working miraculously. My voice can sing and murmur and ask miraculously. My hands may shake, but they can hold me or another. My blood still carries the gifts of the air from my heart to my brain, miraculously. <laughs> Put a finger to my wrist or my temple, and I feel it. I am magic. Life and all its good and bad and ugly things, scary things which I would like to forget, beautiful things which I would like to remember, the whole messy, lovely, true story of myself pulses within me. I believe that the sun shines, if not here, then somewhere. 
somewhere it rains and things will grow green and wonderful. Somewhere inside me too, it rains and things will grow green and wonderful. Sometimes my insides rain from the inside out and then I know I am alive. I am alive. I am alive. Affirmation by Eve L. Ewing. Now let us uh, sing to that being, being alive and being here. Uh, it's hymn number 391. We're going to sing it two times. It's nice and sh it's short. Um, voice still and small. 391. So we've got a story today, and this is a story that uh, uh, is based on a Yiddish folk song, which is also, it's also based on a book. I won't, there are great pictures in here, but uh, I'm going to just tell it, so I'll bring, leave it up here for people who want to read it after, but it's called Joseph Had a Little Overcoat by Sims Tabak, has adopted this, this story. Um, and um, I don't know, um, I'll say this more about this in the sermon, but on Wednesday was, it was, it was Yom Kippur which is a, a special day in the Jewish tradition, Tuesday night to Wednesday night, when, we, when the Jewish people think back to what happened in the year that happened in the past, and then think, what, what's the most, what can we do in the future? And we're gonna be talking about that here today, and part of what we'll be talking about, spoiler alert in the sermon, is making the most of what you've got. And this is a, this is a story that I really like. It's a simple little story, but a lot of simple stories have really profound truths about making the most of what she got. And what Joseph had was a coat. Oh, you thought this was up here by accident, right? <laughs> Joseph had a coat and it was, it, it got a little grungy and old, not saying anything about this coat, which, which I quite like, but um, it, didn't, it, didn't, uh, it didn't quite work. It, it, it wasn't quite working as a coat anymore. And Joseph thought, would I throw out this coat? Should I throw it away? No, right? Don't need to throw things away, right? We recycle, right? So Joseph decided he would make um, a jacket out of this coat. Does anyone have a black jacket? Right, that's, that's the jacket that he made right there. And he made a, a jacket and he said, he had this wonderful jacket and he took it, oh, there's a vest, but he had this jacket and he took it to a special event, oh, oh, his nephew's wedding and he had this jacket. And he had it for a long time and he loved the jacket, but then it got frayed and things, things do break after a time. And then it wasn't, it was old and worn. And did he throw it away? No, no he didn't throw it away. He made a scarf out of it. He put a little color on, on, his, on his thing, right? But he made a scarf. He, he said, there's no need to throw it away just because it's, it's, it's old and worn. And he made a beautiful scarf and he sang in the chorus in the scarf. And it was beautiful. And he, he loved this scarf and it was great. But after a while, it became old and worn. There's an essence of all that. Old and worn. So did he throw it away? Old no. scarf? No, right? <laughs> he made the most of it. And he made a necktie. I don't know where he got all these colors to change. But he made a nice tie about it. 
And he went to visit his family in a tie and he was all dressed up and he was he thought it was wonderful. And he had this wonderful tie and he wore it for a while, but then it got old and worn. It didn't really work as a tie. So did he throw it away? No, no he made the most of it. And he made a handkerchief out of it. Not that handkerchief. Some of you might have handkerchiefs on there. A handkerchief is, what's a handkerchief? Um, a handkerchief, there you go, there's a handkerchief. And you have it there just in case of you need a handkerchief, which you, to sneeze, or, you know, it's sometimes helpful to have. And he drank a glass of hot tea with lemon, having a nice handkerchief around. If it gets hot, you can put it around you. Throw it as well and cool down. So he had a wonderful handkerchief, and he loved his handkerchief, and it was great. Remember, he started with a coat, then he had a handkerchief. But every part of it was nice. It was all nice. But then the handkerchief got old and worn after a while. Old and worn handkerchief. Did he throw it out? No. No, he made the most of it. And he made a button, a little fabric button. And he used it to fasten his suspenders, which was really helpful to have. There's Joseph with his, his button. And uh, the button did become old and worn. He lost it. Oh. You ever lost something? I don't like losing things. He couldn't find the button. So what do you do when you lose a button? He had nothing. What did he? Actually, you know what he did? He made the most of it. He wrote a book about it, or wrote a song about it, as the song goes, actually. He, he, yeah, if you lose, lost a button, right, you could write a book about it, right? So you still have something. So he, it shows, it goes to show you can always make something out of nothing. So don't worry if things get old and worn. Don't worry if it doesn't feel like you have very much. You can always make the most of it. So that's our story here today. And it's, uh, th thank you for sharing it with me and for the, for the props. Um, and now we will uh, sing our, our children out. Uh, so as you are going to have some more activities uh, today, enjoy this. As you leave this friendly place, love give light to every face. May the kindness which you learn light your heart till you return. So now we enter into a time of contemplation and reflection. And one of the things we do co communally here at uh, Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Catskills is joys and sorrows. And that's where anybody can share a brief joy or sorrow or hope or concern, something going on in your So we have a... Um, uh, 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 oh, we have, a, we have a reading here. We have a time of, this is, uh, as I said, Yom Kippur, which I'll say more about in the sermon. So if you don't know what it is, don't worry. But it's a time to think about the kind of the year that we've had and looking forward to the future. And kind of, um, so uh, we've got a, a reading about, um, about that kind of process by, by Lois Van Leer and Kathy. Thank you very much for reading. So this is called Let Go by Lois Van Leer. I think we could all relate to it. Let go of all that binds you, of all that burdens you, of what you carry, of all that shames you, of fear, of trespasses, transgressions, of woundedness. Let go of guilt, let go of anger, let go of the small minded, small mindedness and pettiness of ways of being that no longer work for you, of compulsions that consume your living. Let go of what you cannot change. Let go of regret, of what which haunts you, of that which haunts you. Let go of pain. Let go of ways in which you miss the mark. Just let go. We'll now have a spoken prayer followed by a little bit of silence, and then we've got the responsive reading uh, a little later. Spirit of the wind that blows through the trees, power of creation and consciousness, we come to you again wishing to be made whole. 
to let go of every anything that keeps us from fullest living, from living with deepest conscience, and to be brought again toward the fullness of life. Another year has gone by, the days shorten, the space for dreaming widens. Each of us here do our best to live a pretty good life. There are so many demands and challenges. There are so many opportunities to succeed, as well as so many chances to fail. And we have failed at times, many times over the course of a year. While failure is human, common to us all, we do not casually accept these failures, but feel regret at the times we have fallen short. Most of all, we regret the times we have caused unnecessary pain to others. We offer to you, O place in our hearts that some call God, we offer to you our heart, our sorrow for the pain we have inflicted on others. Let us not keep this offering in our hearts let us not relinquish to God the responsibility to make this world better, but rather let us make amends to our family of all beings, our siblings who are all people, and to the earth from whence we come. Let us seek to forgive ourselves as well, allowing ourselves to be human, made as we are of clay and dreams, and let us try to forgive others as well. Spirit of memory and dream of peace, we also turn to consider the failings of humankind of which we are a part. We see so much hatred, so much ignorance, so much injustice and systemic oppression. We see the earth being massively polluted and carved up and the waters destroyed for the sake of profits and our own comfort. We could react to this by ignoring the hurts of the world, and sometimes we do. We could react to this by pointing fingers and blaming what we see as the worst offenders, and sometimes we do. In this time of atonement of Yom Kippur, however, let us try for a moment to see humanity as one family, all bound together in the workings of fate and human commitment. Let us admit we all have our limitations. And let us also see there is much reason for hope. Let us not hold on to our limitations too tightly, but be willing to make the most of who we are and let go of all the trappings that are keeping us from being who we are. If in our lives we have met people whose inner eyes are open to the wonder of life, let us be grateful for their example. If we have caught a glimpse of what it means to live together in peace, let us carry that glimpse wherever we go. If we have in our hearts any inkling of beauty and wonder and majesty that are writ large on a starry autumn night, let us be committed to be creatures of hope with the courage to live a life of promise in an uncertain world. This is our prayer. We offer it and also we listen to hear in the silence how we are being called to greater wholeness. And we'll have a time of silence.
turn once again our hearts towards peace. We have a, a responsive reading now that goes along with uh, Yom Kippur. I could not read this this year. Um, the Reverend Rob Eller Isaac, who wrote this uh, prayer in, in, in the Yom Kippur tradition and, and a Unitarian Universalist minister as well, uh, died a few months ago. Um, his uh, memorial service is on, is on YouTube, actually, and, and a tribute to his, his wonderful life. But this is um, something, um, uh, you, it's, in, it's number 637 in your books. Uh, you may have it on your screens. If not, um, the, the response is, 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 is the same every time. We forgive ourselves and each other. We begin again in love. So we hear all the ways that we fall short, and then we forgive ourselves, there we go, and each other, and begin again in love. Number 637. For remaining silent when a single voice would have made a difference. We forgive ourselves and each other. We begin again in love. For each time that our fears have made us rigid and inaccessible, we forgive ourselves and each other, and we begin again in love. For each time that we have struck out in anger without just cause. We forgive ourselves and each other. We begin again in love. For each time that our greed has blinded us to the needs of others. We forgive ourselves and each other. We begin again in love. For the selfishness which sets us apart and alone. We forgive ourselves and each other. We begin again in love. For falling short of the admonitions of the spirit. We forgive ourselves and each other. We begin again in love. For losing sight of our unity. We forgive ourselves and each other. We begin again in love. For those and for so many acts, both evident and subtle, which have fueled the illusion of separationness. We forgive ourselves and each other. We begin again in love. Oh yeah, I'll, I'll, um, so the um, the October half plate donations. Are... No, 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 no. Okay. you read it. Okay. <laughs> I just like hearing you talk. I think you do such a great job. Um, the October half plate donations this uh, month go to support Harambe. Um, many of us, have, have, uh, it's a, ma a marvelous organization, a mid Hudson Valley coalition that supports and promotes the strength of our community through cultural and educational events that enriches the lives of youth and, and, and adults and also the executors of Pine Street African Burial Grounds, which you can visit in Kingston, Pine Street. Um, does some really amazing, wonderful work. Um, Tyrone, actually, from Harambe is going to be one of the panelists um, at, our, um, uh, at the Resilience Filming, which is happening here October 16th, a film and a panel, which you all can come to. Um, October 20th, right? October 20th, it's on a Thursday. It's on the website, you know, don't, don't take my word for it. October 20th, uh, uh, about, um, about how, we, how we are resilient in the face of trauma. And Harambe is such a, a great example of ways to build resilience and artistry and hope. Um, so there are lots of ways to donate. You can find them on your screens. You can donate um, in, in person or via check or on the, on the, on the website. Um, our offertory today, we are grateful for the offertory, The Impossible Dream. Uh, some of you may be familiar with by Mitch Lay, mm -hmm. and it'll be per per performed by Bill Tool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
Thank you for all that you all do for this community. This community is a gathering of gifts, whether it be financial support or the gifts of uh, talent and, and uh, all the different uh, talents that so many people bring to this congregation or the gifts of presence, which is most important of all, being who you are in community. Uh, thank you for all you bring to this, this uh, congregation, to this community. So we're in fall, in case you haven't noticed, it's a good season. Fall is a particularly good season, I find, for looking forward into the future and backward into the past. In uh, September, you know, the academic year often starts at all different kind of uh, levels and schools and institutions and parents and teachers and students all look forward to the year ahead and do some planning. Here at the congregation, we do some planning, burst of energy. Um, and it's also a time for looking backwards as the leaves fall. We often think about people that were missing, maybe people who have died, and the veil of memory seems particularly thin. They seem close to us often in the fall as the leaves fall. It's a time of looking forward and backwards. This weekend, of course, uh, is a weekend with lots of meaning attached to it. It is uh, Indigenous Peoples Day or Columbus Day, um, depending on which or both you honor. Um, Columbus Day looks back at an exp expedition over 500 years ago that, although it had a great deal of courage attached to it, also we are now realizing also was the beginning of a long age of atrocities for the Indigenous people, mm -hmm. of, of horrors, and we think back that with um, a sense of uh, disturbance and shame. Um, and Indigenous Peoples Day, well, there's lots of Indigenous peoples native to North America. Um, and I, looking forward, I often think of the Haudenosaunee people and the seven generations principle. Which you may have heard about this idea that um, philosophy that we, with every decision, we look forward seven generations into the future, uh, which is a long time these days to look forward to vision. So adding to all this sense of reflection on the future and the past is uh, the days of awe in the Jewish tradition, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, which just happened, Rosh Hashanah being 10 days before Yom Kippur, and Yom Kippur being Tuesday night to Wednesday night. And Rosh Hashanah is the Jewish New Year, the day commemorating the beginning of the world. Um, and uh, it's kind of a celebratory, but it's also a solemn day, because between those days of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur comes a chance to contemplate our life and think about from it from a Jewish perspective to think about um, what we've done in the past year and how the year has has been and what could happen in the year and in the future and so we think about our lives I'm seeing myself on a screen I'm going to just close this I think thinking about ourselves is just sometimes challenging to see ourselves right right I didn't intend that Re echo resonance but it um, as I've, I think I've said once before, there's this belief of the, the book of life, which is the idea like, what, what would it be like if every one of our actions, good and bad, was written in the book of life of every action from human beings to prokaryotes? Um, and it's kind of um, an awesome idea. Um, and it's a bit of a scary one, because we look back on our ideas and we think, are we worthy to be in that book, that marvelous, glorious book? If someone were to write a book of everything that happens from year to year, um, in, in the year, what year is it now? 5328 in the Jewish record? I probably got that wrong. I, anyway, you can correct me after this. Um, 2022, whatever you want to say, are we worthy to be in that, in that book? And we think about it, and from the J Jewish people will think about it through the week. And the culmination of these days of awe, awe is Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, which is quite a serious day. Many observant Jews fast from sundown to sundown. Many go to shul, go to temple for services to commemorate the day. And just about every Jewish person will reflect on life, think about what they have done and hope for a good year ahead. Think about, am I worthy to be written in the book of life? And the answer, the Yom Kippur answer, the religious answer of, am I worthy to be written in the book of life is, nah, not really. <laughs> I mean, because it's because it's a time for radical honesty, right? If we all stand before God, if we believe in God or the mystery, the divine, if we all stand on that place and really 
look at ourselves. Are we, are we really worthy of all that glory of the book of life? And if we're honest, none of us um, is worthy. We, we heard a little bit in that responsive reading, we thought about all the ways that we have fallen short. And yes, we forgive ourselves and each other, but we look at all these ways that we do, that we, um, we don't speak up when we should speak up. We, we lie, we, 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 we tilt the scales a little bit. We all do these things and it's human nature. We do all these things. And, and in, the, in, the, in the liturgy of, of Yom Kippur, there's, it, goes, it goes on for quite a way. We betray, we steal, we scorn, we slander. And the whole congregation says this together and it's quite humbling to kind of to, to think all this and to think, wow, you know, it's not, not easy to admit all this, but it's important to admit it, right? Because we want to live honest lives and it may turn our hearts towards repentance and living more rightly in the year to come. The Kol Nidre, Kol Nidre services on the first night are particularly moving and haunting. It's a text that's many centuries old. Nobody knows quite where it comes from. It's sung in Aramaic. And I should say before I talk about Kol Nidre that it's, 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 it's kind of misunderstood in a very offensive and anti-Semitic way by, by non-Jews over the centuries when there was such rife anti-Semitism because the Kol Nidre, what it says is all vows. And the basic idea of it is it's the cantor who's this singer um, the, the, the liturgist um, it says we annul all vows in the year ahead. So from an anti-Semitic point of view, people say, well, that's just saying that Jewish people, they don't stick to their promises. And that's not what it is at all. That's completely wrong. In fact, it's about 180 degrees wrong. What it is, is saying a form of ultimate humility, ultimate humility, because no matter what promises we make, we, can, we strive our best to keep up, up, up for them and to know that we will always fall short. So it's saying, let's be really where, uh, careful of what promises we make and let's try really hard to live up to them. And let's not be too proud even if we keep them all because really we, we, we're not gonna keep every promise. We're not perfect. This Kol Nidre prayer through the centuries in, inspires contr contrition in Jewish hearts from generation to generation and invites anyone participating to live a life of both earnest striving as well as deep forgiveness for ourselves and for each other. We know that we're only human and we know how hard it is to live the light, right way and it allows us to be more forgiving of our neighbor, knowing just how hard this is to do the right thing, to live the right way. The theme for this month of October is courage. And I wanted to talk about humility too, because I think the two go, go really great together, like peanut butter and chocolate or whatever, pick your, pick your combination. Courage and humility, humility and courage. Humility says, I'm only one person. I cannot do everything, which is true. And courage says, yes, you are one person and you can do something and you should do something, to paraphrase a reading by Edmund Everett Hale, which is also true. Courage says, you can do anything you set your mind to. And humility says, well, maybe not everything. But anyway, there are some things you shouldn't do just because you can. And so be careful, think about what you actually should do. Humility says, you know, if I'm being honest, that jacket is pretty old and worn. It's not going to do it anymore. And courage says, well, it may not work as a jacket, but what a fabulous vest that's going to be. And you realize that story is not just about jackets and vests and ties. It's about what's within ourselves as well and looking at ourselves and maybe things aren't perfect but we make the most of it. I find that courage and humility are just terrific practical touchstones, everyday virtues that ground my day. Now I have a soft spot for faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love, as the reading says, but those are big values. If I'm not feeling the hope, I've spoken about hope here uh, from, from on, on our services together. If I'm not feeling the hope, I can't just flick a switch and turn it on, right? You need to nurture that hope. Pay attention to where hope is in the world. Nurture it in yourself. Listen to that hopelessness and what it's saying to you. and Try to live gently into that hope. If you're not feeling that faith, if you don't feel you believe in anything anymore, you don't, you don't have that touchstone of belief of the, of, of, of the right, of the good, of, 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 of God, of whatever. You know, if you don't feel that belief, you can't just instantly turn it on. You have to kind of see where that belief is and nurture it kind of almost like a little shoot of grass let it watch it grow and and water it and so and love 
you just have to, it, it would be great if we could instantly be more loving, right? But we need to take some time. But courage and humility, well, we might say that courage doesn't instantly uh, appear either. But sometimes we can just muster up the courage to say, you know, I can, I can, I can do enough to, to show up this day. I can do something. I think about when I was, um, my, my mother's a French teacher. So for a couple of hot vacations, I remember we went to like France or Montreal. And so she would always say, oh, Bob, it's your turn to go into the um, croissant shop, the boulangerie and order something because she had taught me a little bit of French. Um, and I was thinking, you know, you're the French teacher, like you'd be really good at this, mom. <laughs> but I knew that she was trying to teach me something and I was, you know, trying to learn. So she, you know, she'd wait in the car and I, I would go in that, that, that door and, and, and order, and, you know. It's nothing like the shop door when it jingles on the way in and everybody turns to you. <laughs> but I was also kind of, and I was nervous, but I was also kind of excited, right? Yeah, you know, I felt this like, here's a chance to, to see what would happen. Can I, can I order croissants in a, in a boulangerie? I mean, it turned out I could. It also turned out that I got an awful lot of help. They saw an 11 year old kid and, you know, mostly pointing at things and trying out um, <laughs> words that didn't quite come across. But at the end of the day, I realized that as I've said before, courage, a lot of courage is just showing up. You walk through the door, you ring the bell, and then you see what happens. And you see what happens. You may show up with a glorious overcoat. You may show up with a, a little scraggly tie, but you show up with what you've got and you make the most of it. And so it's taught me that and many other experiences that courage is really helpful to have. And Goodness knows we all need courage, right? These are fearful times. I mean, looking seven generations into the future, wow. With climate change, which is already happening, species extinction, the threat of nuclear war, which we're reading about in the news. And meanwhile, every time we walk out of our door into another building, we have to worry about uh, COVID and every bit as dangerous to our bodies and our spirits are the societal pandemics of racism and homophobia and transphobia, misogyny, all the hatreds that lash out on anyone who has a little bit of courage. And every day they inflict terrible wounds. There's plenty to be fearful about. But humility and courage can be helpful. Even humility, I think, can be helpful. Humility, humble, human, and humor, in fact, hummus, who doesn't love hummus, all come from the same root, from the earth being grounded. Remember, you are dust, and to dust you shall return. We're all just reconstituted earth, clumps of ground forming intricate things like neurons and eyelashes and fingernails and all sorts of wonderful things. We're just mud. Humility <laughs> invites us to not think ourselves as the center of the universe, but at the same time, that doesn't mean we're nobody, right? We may be just mud, but we're quite interesting clusters of reconstituted mud. <laughs> Say the human brain is the most complex um, per square inch thing in the universe that we know of so far. So it's pretty amazing how all that mud has made something quite, um, quite interesting. And more importantly than that, we're all capable of kindness. So you make the most of what you've got. Gregory the Great wrote that to pretend we don't have anything to offer, and don't we hear that sometimes? We say, well, I, there's nothing I can do. You know, I'm just me. You know, I, I, I see those, you know, it's great, those great, great people. People are doing wonderful things. But me, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't do anything. And Gregory the Great, who wrote in about the 8th century, said, um, and his name was Gregory the Great. I mean, you know, maybe humility wasn't his strong suit. He was called that by somebody else. But he said, to say that we don't have anything to offer is actually not humility. It's false pride. Because it's saying, oh, I'm not going to, you know, I'm too important to show up with what I've got. All I've got is a necktie. All I've got is a bookmark. All I've got is a button. And I've lost that button. I'm not, I'm not going to show up. And so Gregory says, true humility is saying, I don't know what I've got. I, I don't know if I've got that button or if I've lost it. But I'm going to show up. And I think that's all we can do is kind of be present to one another and be present to this world. I know a few of you, and I hope more will sign up, are coming to Albany this coming Friday on the 14th. Do I have that right? What day is it today? 
14th, thank you. Um, going, going up to Albany and uh, Kathy Kasner, I see Karen, okay. Um, um, and, and doing that for a protest to, to tell specifically TD Bank to stop investing in new fossil fuel infrastructure. Um, and more generally just defunding this climate chaos that we're still funding fossil fuels when we know what's happening to our planet, you know, is just nuts. And so people are showing up and they're going to show up with signs in front of Albany and, and, and say, you know, let's, let's change the funding structure. And it may seem like not much. It may seem like nothing. But it's showing up. It's knowing we can do something. We can be somewhere. We can make the most and show up. So that's what we have. If we don't have anything else, we have courage and we have humility. We're just one little person in this great big world, but we have great courage to do whatever we are able to do, to just do. I'll share one more um, ritual. I always like to close with a story, which is Tashlicht. Does anyone, know? I'm sure a couple of people know what Tashlicht is, but it's more of with Rosh Hashanah than, than, and, uh, than Yom Kippur, but you, that Lois Van Leer reading about letting go, um, it's this wonderful physical ritual of you, you bring, you carry breadcrumbs um, and you can sometimes think about how you have crumbs in your, in your clothes. I always do. I don't know about you, but if I'm driving, especially clothes, and you go to a fresh body of water and you just shake them out into the water. And this ritual is centuries old and like all Jewish rituals, there's lots of theories about what that actually means. But the general sense of it, which is, which is very clear, is you let go of everything that's holding you back. You just, you know, we all make mistakes. We all have stuff in us. We all have fall short. We, and it's good to admit that. And it's good to honestly say that. But then you come to the water. You come to the wholeness of the earth. And you, 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 you grab what you got and you let go. And then you find out you've got, um, you still got your overcoat. Or maybe you don't and you go swimming. And, <laughs> but you take what you've got and you make the most of it. And that is enough. Every day that's enough. If you show up with courage and humility, the faith will come, the hope will come, the love will come. Just be present to the day and whatever the day brings, be who you are, be humble about it. Don't try to pretend that you're more than you are. We're reconstituted mud, but in a pretty special way. Um, so let's, let's be there for one another. Um, let's be there for our world and let's make the most of it. Amen. Amen. Let's sing our closing hymn here today. It's number 108 in Gray Hymnals. My life flows on in endless song.
Thank you to everyone who made this service happen, to Kathy, to Catherine, uh, Bruce, and Kathy, and, and everybody who uh, helped, and Bill, ever make this service happen. Stick around for um, this uh, courageous new uh, possibilities uh, that we're gonna talk about um, in this service. And after that, there'll be, there'll be refreshments, and after that, there'll be dancing. There's a country dance on 12 to two. So if that doesn't fill you with joy, don't know what, what will. So I invite you to feel your heart for a moment Courage, I said uh, uh, humility comes from earth. Courage, as Mark reminded me, comes from heart, le, le coeur. And if you have that heart that beats, you can feel that courage. You have enough. You've been given something very special. That pumping heart, these thoughts that wing our way through us, that love that connects us and binds us. And all you have to do is just live out that love as best you can. You'll make mistakes along the way, we all do, but shake them, shake them loose, let them go. Live out that love boldly, courageously, and love the heck out of this world. Amen. Now we extinguish this chalice. Warmth of love. Thank <laughs> you.